Hello everyone and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On the bench here, you see a Macintosh SE, and that very machine is actually our family computer, the one that my family bought around 1987. It's kind of funny that over the years I've had many computers as I've talked about on the channels, but none of them got kept. All of them were given away or sold at garage sales, things like that, except for this Macintosh SE. It's the only thing that survived and as you can see, it still works perfectly. I've actually never had to do any repairs on this, well, other than the disk drive getting gummed up and the internal hard drive dying. Anyways, what I'm going to be talking about in this video is how slow this computer is. Even when it was new and I was using it back in the 80s, I really felt that the Macintosh SC gave a pretty nice but slow experience. It was honestly my biggest gripe about this machine, which I otherwise really loved. So, on today's video, let's try to fix that, make it a little faster. So without further ado, let's get right to it. When Apple released the Macintosh SE, it was an iteration of the Mac Plus, which was also an iteration of the Mac 512 and the Mac 128, the very first compact Macintosh in this form factor. The Macintosh SE was released around 1987, if I recall, or perhaps in the very end of 1986, and architecturally, it was pretty much identical to the very first Macintosh in this form factor, the Macintosh 128. This is a Macintosh SE motherboard here, and you see this large IC is the 8 megahertz Motorola 68000. It was a very advanced processor for the day, being a 32-bit processor with a 24-bit address bus, which allowed up to 16 megas of RAM to be addressed, and is generally considered to be a very fast and efficient processor. Now, when I talk about the Mac SE being slow, the real reason for that is it comes from the fact that Apple didn't include any coprocessors on the Macintosh line at all, at least at this point, so that this 8 megahertz processor had to do all the heavy lifting. Even though this machine has a very compact shape and only 9 inches, it does have a display resolution of 512 by 384, or maybe it's 354, something like that. It's monochrome, but it's relatively high resolution, and the CPU has to do all of the pushing of the pixels around in the screen memory. And Apple's operating system that ran on the Macintoshes was quite advanced for the day and allowed a very nice and crisp graphical user interface, which even today is still relatively easy to use this operating system because all of the conventions in this OS that Apple pioneered here are pretty much the same as what we have today on current Macintoshes and Windows for the most part. But the negative of that is there's quite a bit going on with this machine. Now, it could be a lot slower, but you notice when I move this window around, it has to redraw all of the contents of what's below it. And that's because, of course, these machines don't have a lot of memory, with 4 megs at most, so it doesn't keep copies of whatever was overlapped from another window, which means it has to draw it every time you move a window. Now, this particular Macintosh is running System 6, which is the sweet spot for these old Macintoshes, at least the 68,000 ones. You're generally going to get the best performance out of these machines when you run this system. But it was very common back in the day to upgrade these computers to System 7, which was quite a lot more capable, including the capability of running multiple programs at once. But the horrible side effect was it really slowed the computer down a lot more. I think that's something that throws people for a loop on this older OS on the Mac, is even though it's very graphical and it looks very similar to what we're used to today, if I run a program like Disk First Aid, all of the Finder windows and everything are gone. All I can do is use this program here, and the only way to get back to the hard drive to see what files I had on there or whatever would be to exit out of this program, which you have to go File Quit, and you'll see the Finder will come back. It'll redraw all those windows. With System 6, with MultiFinder, or with System 7 installed, you could run multiple programs at once and switch between them, just like you could on a modern computer today, but you'd have that severe performance penalty. The 8 MHz 68000 on this machine, when equipped with coprocessors like on the Amiga, is very capable of running multiple programs at once and feeling quick and responsive, but when you're asking to do all the work, it's just not so great. 
When you compare the Macintosh of this era to the IBM PC, they're similar in that the PC was also having to push around all the pixels on the screen and do everything else without any coprocessors. There was no multitasking capabilities or anything like that. But the one advantage that the PC had is by the early 90s when System 7 came out for this old classic Macintosh, this Mac SE, we were already up to very fast 286s and 386s were out as well which were so much faster than the 8 megahertz 68,000 here, allowing those machines running say Windows 3.0 or 3.1 to easily run multiple applications and do them with relative speed and ease, and in color of course as well. In the late 80s when the Mac SE was a relatively common machine to find in people's houses, there was an option for speeding it up though. And on the motherboard here, the processor is not removable, but there is a slot right here and it's called the PDS slot or processor direct slot and it allows access to all of the address and data lines and other signaling available to the 68000, allowing the Mac SE to be upgraded in all sorts of different ways. And the SE was the first Macintosh ever to have an expansion slot like this. Nothing before it had ever had it, and plenty of machines after it did. When the SE was released, there were actually faster versions of the 68000 line of chips available. And I don't just mean the 68000 with a higher clock speed. I'm talking about much more capable versions of this chip. The 6810 existed, which was actually pin compatible with the 68000, and you could swap that into a Mac SE and get a little bit of a speed boost, but that chip was really never used very much because it, it was such a minor speed improvement. But the 6820 and the 6830 existed, which had much more optimized internal instructions and internal cache, which sped up the speed of the execution of code dramatically. They also had 32-bit RAM addressing, which allowed you to break through the 16 megabyte barrier of the 16 meg address space on this particular chip. A few years after the Macintosh SE came out, Apple released the SE30, which was basically the same computer, both from a form factor and shape, but the motherboard was redesigned with a Motorola 68030 and a math coprocessor and eight memory slots. So it could address tons of RAM. I think 128 megs is the max RAM that can take. And it really flies. It's super fast for the compact black and white Macintoshes. In fact, I think without accelerators, it is the fastest one Apple ever sold. It was a great machine and I lusted after it when I was a kid, but it was extremely expensive and it was not the machine we had. We had the regular SE. And that finally leads me to what I have in my hands here. These are Macintosh SE accelerators. This accelerator here, we've actually seen on the channel before. This is a Radius SE accelerator. And this has a Motorola 68020 and also a math code processor, a 68881. So I'm not actually sure how fast this runs at. It has a crystal oscillator here of 51 megahertz. So it's surely divided down to some extent, maybe by three or by two. This card has actually been seen on the channel before because this was donated with a bunch of other Macintosh parts by a wonderful viewer out of Germany. And uh, he sent this stuff in and it didn't actually work when I tried it last time. This board is primarily all GAL chips, which are programmable array logic. And that's what all of these lattice chips are here. These take a lot of 74 LS TTL logic and condense it down using equations into these chips. So it's a way to make a complex board much smaller. Now, fortunately, if any of these have a fault, it means this board is not going to work and there's no way to make it work because each of these chips has custom set of equations loaded into them. And it matters that they're even in the right sockets. If someone swapped these two chips around, I'll have no way to know. And this board's not going to work either. It's not clear to me exactly how much an accelerator card like this would have cost. The date codes on all these ICs is at the very end of 1987. So this thing probably would have cost $1,500 when it was new. And in 1987, that's a lot of money. The one thing about this Radius accelerator card is it doesn't have any additional RAM on it. And the Mac SE only supported up to four megabytes of memory on the motherboard. And that's all you could ever get out of your Mac if you were using this particular accelerator. To install this accelerator card onto your Mac SE, you simply line it up with the PDS slot and you push it down. And there are some standoffs here that you're supposed to screw onto the bottom side of the motherboard. I think these ROM chips help this board initialize when you first turn on the computer. So you don't necessarily need drivers, although I'm not totally sure of that and I can't find any documentation for this board. Even though this board offered no RAM expansion, it did have one other cool feature up its sleeve and it was this board right here. This is the Radius two page display and actually plugs in like this, sticking up perpendicular from the accelerator board. But this is also it would fit inside the Mac SE case. 
with this board installed into the accelerator, this gives the Macintosh SE 1024 by 768 monochrome graphics for an external 21 inch monitor. There's a little two pin header right here that would connect to a little BNC jack on the back of the machine. The Macintosh SE has an actual expansion slot on the back cover, which lines up perfectly between these two holes and this header here. And that would allow you to do full on two page desktop publishing on your Mac SE and not be stuck using that little nine inch screen. There isn't a whole lot going on on this board. There's a couple of ROM chips that helps initialize the external video. We have some video RAM. So this is the RAM buffer for the machine, bus transceiver, and this is the RAM DAC. So this chip converts the video information that's stored in this special memory here and displays it on this video connector. There is no video acceleration whatsoever on this video board. The processor is still doing all the heavy lifting, but because this has a much faster processor than the original Mac, it's gonna perform a lot better than if you had just added a two page display card right onto the Mac SE. And Radius did make those as well. It would still run at the eight megahertz though, so it would be really, really slow. Now it's funny because Radius could have theoretically made a larger connector available on this board to add additional memory. There just aren't enough pins on this connector to offer the capability of a large high performance RAM expansion. And that means that this processor is stuck working with the slow 16 bit memory that is on the main motherboard. So that brings me to this, another accelerator for the Mac SE. This one is the Orion by Mac Peak Systems. And unlike the Radius card, this has eight additional memory slots on it. And almost surely these are wired up in 32 bit data path to the CPU, meaning you'll have to populate four of these slots at a time because of the 32 bit data bus. You notice here there's an empty socket and this will be for the 688881, the math code processor. I'm not sure I had enough eights there. That's where this would go. This is the Motorola 68020 as well. It's running at 20 megahertz and the crystal oscillator confirms that. And right here, there is another chip socket with a PCB installed into it, a little piece of Velcro, which I assume is to prevent um, this board from touching the metal inside the case. This is gonna be for the 688851, I think it is. It's the memory management unit. That chip ended up later being integrated into the 68030, but on the 68020, it wasn't. The memory management unit, from my understanding, is required if you wanna run more than 16 megabytes of memory on this accelerator board. In addition, virtual memory requires the MMU as well. If you were to fully populate this board with four megabyte modules, you'd end up with 32 megabytes of RAM on it, which would definitely require the MMU. This little PCB probably shorts some pins together to bypass the need for the MMU when you're only running eight megabytes of RAM on this board. Now this thing actually is populated with 256K SIMs for a total of two megabytes. And I really don't know much about this board at all. I tried doing some research and I could find very little about it. It does have two ROM chips on here, but I peeled up one of the stickers and these are actually just the main ROM chips from the SE motherboard, which are these two chips right here. In fact, this was the actual motherboard that this accelerator was installed onto when I got it. And the two ROMs are actually removed from it and clearly they've been moved onto the accelerator board. In addition, you'll notice there's just one memory module right here installed, and this is exactly how it came. I'm not quite sure this is gonna work though, because the Macintosh SE video circuitry uses the main memory here, and it will require these two SIMs to be installed. I think the problem may be that this clip on this side of this SIM socket right here is broken. So it could be that this motherboard doesn't work properly anymore. There is a broken clip right here on this accelerator as well. These things are just so fragile and people are very careless when they take the memory in and out, often snapping them off. It may be okay though, because uh, this side right here is holding the module in and maybe with these low profile modules, it, uh, it actually holds it in well enough. The only information I could find on this accelerator card was this forum post on 68K MLA, where someone was trying to identify an accelerator board that looked identical to this one here it is right here. Unfortunately, I can't look at the pictures any larger. They don't enlarge, but we can definitely see that this is the exact same board. Another user had found a similar card and it says that theirs has the SE SuperDrive ROMs installed on it. That's these two ROM chips here. Uh, this one, as I said, just has the normal non-SuperDrive or 800K ROMs installed in these sockets. 
He says jumpers, which are these right here, are for selecting RAM sizes, and his are missing. The original poster says that the badge on the Mac SE said Hypercharger 020. He thinks his is an Orion 25 card, which I guess is 25 megahertz versus the 20 megahertz that this one is. But definitely it says Orion right here on the top. Looks like the original poster was trying to get the board working and it just doesn't seem to work without the necessary software. He says he got it working at 14 megahertz with some Gemstart 3.0 drivers. But here, this poster talks about Mac Peak Systems. That's the company that made this board. Based out of Austin, Texas, they sold this for the SE and it was the Orion card. They were about $800 and then discounted or renamed the Orion and sold the next version as the Irwin Accelerator. He goes on to say that the original disc he got with his actually had nothing on it. Um, and he emailed them three, four, five, or six times. And he asked for a replacement disc, but he never got a response from them. Maybe Mac Peak had gone out of business by that point. This user goes on to have pictures of the Irwin and I guess the Orion stuff, but all of the photos are broken on here. He does go on to mention that this expansion header here is for a grand daughter board, the PowerView large screen video display, which was not mentioned in all versions of the manual user guides he have found. Another user does say that his Hypercharger 020 has no ROMs on it, and it actually does work without any drivers, although the math coprocessor won't work without additional software. Oh, and this user scanned some pages from the manual, and all of them are broken. He says that the SIM distribution on the motherboard, two SIMs and two SIMs only have to be on the motherboard, is different depending on which version of the SE is present. The front row on one SE motherboard and the back row on the other version. Okay, well that is a good little tidbit there for trying to get this working. So that is the end of that thread. It's all from 2015. So if you know anything more about this board or how to get it working with software or even the manual scans, definitely please let me know. But I guess for now, Let's see if I can get this accelerator board working on one of these SE motherboards. I took the cover off the old original Mac SE. Boy, I've been inside this computer a lot of times throughout my life. This is the original motherboard for it. No broken SIM slots on it. I never broke anything on here. And actually this one is interesting because it actually has a jumper here to help you configure the memory. I noticed these other motherboards here have resistors that you have to cut. I also had replaced a long time ago the battery, and I put in a CR2032 holder here. It's a little janky. It looks like I did some hot glue or something on there ages ago. But yeah, this is the original motherboard from this computer that we, when we bought it. I'm gonna put the original motherboard away for safekeeping and I'll do my testing on these motherboards, which I don't even know if they work. Let's try out this first motherboard here. It doesn't have any broken memory slots and I've actually installed known good one megabyte modules onto here. So hopefully this should just work. Someone has already removed the battery uh, at a previous time. Testing motherboards on the Mac SE is all a little precarious because the power cord, the power and the video cord that goes to the motherboard is not that long. So you have to kind of have the motherboard sitting off the back of the machine just like this. Uh, so just make sure it doesn't uh, contact anything metal while you're running it. I don't have the internal floppy or hard drive connected to this motherboard. If the machine actually powers up and seems to be working, I'll connect some external stuff. All right, good sign. We have the mouse pointer up in the corner there and it's working. I'm gonna connect up my SD to SCSI adapter here for booting this machine. It's very convenient because on the Mac SE or later, termination power from the motherboard actually powers this up right off the SCSI cable. Sweet, just like that, this thing. Oh, I was about to say it booted up and worked. And yet, <laughs> I meant to move the mouse. And it did that. So maybe this motherboard is not quite working. Let me reboot it. All right, after a reboot, can the mouse move now? Yes, it can. Weird. So that's not reassuring that it crashed that way. System 6.07, and we do have four megabytes of RAM showing up on here, which is what I have populated. But why exactly did it corrupt and crash like that? I know the memory is good. Well, it seems to be working fine at the moment. Uh, to know for sure, uh, this game is good because it has a demo that plays if you just leave it sitting there. So in this little box here is the RAM size configuration <laughs> resistors, I guess you can call them. I was going to say jumpers. It's jumpers on the other motherboard that uh, came in the original machine. But this one here does have two resistors. Well, it had one installed and it was cut away. I'm pretty sure that this configuration as it sits right here 
is what you would have for four megabytes of RAM. And this other motherboard that had the accelerator installed on it and the missing module here with the broken clip, it has one resistor hastily soldered across the bottom here where it says one row and above there 256 kilobit is missing. Now this is 256 kilobit memory right here. It's 256K uh, by eight bits wide. So that's a total of 256 kilobytes. And I would assume one row means you need two modules in here. So it's definitely not gonna work like this. This processor has a 16-bit data bus to the memory, which requires at least two modules at a time. There are no ROMs on this motherboard, so I can't test it until I transfer ROMs onto it. So I'm just gonna take them off this motherboard that we just tested, and we'll see if I can bring that other board to life. Let's plug this into the computer with one module installed and just see what happens. So we have an unhappy Macintosh there, uh, except it's missing stripes. And that's probably because the way the RAM on the motherboard works is it interleaves the two modules together to alternate these stripes going down the screen. I went into Rami's stash and I found this random 256 kilobit 30 pin module here. So I'm just gonna pop this in. It seems like the one clip is holding it in okay. All right, plug back into the computer here. When I power this on, we should at least have a screen that is fully depopulated. Oh, well, look at that. What an interesting pattern. So the machine doesn't have a sad Mac. It's actually trying to boot. The flashing disk question mark is there and working, although the mouse pointer is sort of behind these stripes. I've never seen this particular issue before, and it looks <laughs> rather cool, actually. I mean, I have to say, this is a... Uh, a pretty interesting effect. Now I'm wondering if this problem is happening because this motherboard is set to one megabyte modules and it has 256K modules in there. So it's trying to address memory that doesn't exist and it's just looping around on top of itself. So I think I could either try to reinstall a resistor on that position or just replace these two modules with one meg ones. That's easier. Flashing disk question mark. Let me plug the SCSI to SD in and just make sure this machine boots, which it will with uh, only two megs of RAM. That's enough for system six. And it booted right up showing two megs of RAM. Thumbs up. So taking a look at this accelerator card that was on this motherboard that we're testing right now, I'm noticing that this one module here looks different. And the one single module that was in the motherboard actually matches the rest of them but I have a really hard time believing that someone would pay money for this expensive accelerator and then populate it with a total of two megabytes of memory. That doesn't make any sense. But on the other hand, I don't know how these memory size jumpers work exactly. So it's probably best off that at least I test this board out with the memory installed that was on here, just see if it works. And if it doesn't, then maybe swap this out and start fiddling around with these jumpers. I also really don't know for sure if this accelerator was installed onto this motherboard or if these were just placed together before they were given to me. Anyway, let me finally test out this accelerator and see if it works. First thing to do is pull these ROM chips out of here. And let me push on and install the accelerator board. There are the two standoffs that hold it away from the board. The little clips are broken though, so they don't really stay in anymore. But if this works, I may pillage the standoffs from that radius card because those use screws. Oh, that does not look good. That does not look good. This is almost certainly indicative of the processor not running at all. That means that the RAM is uninitialized. This is just how it looked when it powered on. And the video circuitry just displays what's in the memory. It doesn't rely on the processor for that at all. Pushing the reset button shouldn't do anything at all, and sure enough, it does not. Two memory modules installed on the motherboard, but they had to be in very specific slots. So maybe the problem is these are in the wrong slots. I don't know. I think for fun, I should test out this radius board again. I think it had a similar issue, and when it was plugged in, you got absolutely no activity out of the Mac whatsoever. So I do need to reinstall the ROM chips. Uh, into this motherboard with the four megs of RAM. That's what I'm gonna do first. The radius card is installed. Let's power this back up. I'm fully expecting that same garbage screen or simply nothing. <laughs> nothing at all. There is high voltage on the CRT when it was running there. That means the horizontal sink is being output from the motherboard. Just interesting that we get nothing at all. 
And I wonder if the radius card is trying to display on that external monitor. Maybe I should hook up the speaker. Let's, let's try hooking up the speaker. Maybe there's a system beep and that'll tell me that the system is actually running and it's just not displaying anything. All right, try number two. So the speaker had a pop, but no beep. Okay, so this thing is definitely not working. So I decided to go back to the original motherboard and install the resistor so that it would run at 250 kilobit memory. So a total of 512K. And you see the system has a system error trying to boot. And that's because system six can't work with 512K. That's just not enough. So it bombs out at boot. I did a little testing off camera and I found that if I tried to turn on the Mac without the ROMs installed and no accelerator, I got that same garbage screen at startup as when the Orion accelerator was installed on the system with the ROM chips in the accelerator. So that gave me an idea that perhaps the ROM chips in the accelerator are bad, the two that were installed in there. I peeled up the stickers and they were definitely the original Apple chips under there. So I'm taking the known good chips out of this motherboard and I will install them in the accelerator. I know you can't really read it, but under the chips that I took off the accelerator, I had little stickers under there that actually tells you to which ROM chip goes into which socket. It actually has the Apple part number on it. So that way I'm not mixing up the high and the low chip. So with the known good ROM chips installed into the Mac, it's actually working. It's actually freaking working. Okay, well, it gave a sad Mac, but that's a lot better than it was doing before. The sad Mac indicates that the ROMs are actually executing. So those original ROM chips that were on here, I guess were bad, or maybe they were installed in the wrong sockets. I didn't double check that. So believe it or not, the Mac SE is running Crystal Crest right now, and this is the Orion accelerator in here, and it's absolutely working. I went through all four combinations on the RAM size jumpers or whatever those do. And it turns out that there are two configurations that yield four megabytes of RAM, even though I have a full eight megabytes populated and two of the other configurations result in a SAD Mac. This one giving a code of F and A, it's all zeros and an F and A. And this one results in a code of three and then FFFF. I tried various combinations of getting RAM working in the accelerator, but it turns out that only four one megabyte sticks are supported in one of the banks. The other bank is always ignored. And if I install 16 megs of RAM into that one bank that works, it only shows up as four megabytes. Even with eight megabytes installed, it doesn't matter how you configure the jumpers, four megabytes is all it ever sees. The machine as it is here is actually totally stable. It's actually been running like this for a few hours now, and it obviously hasn't crashed. The game is still running and loading up the speedometer app, which is the only thing that kind of can show you system information that I have on my SD card here. It does show a Mac SE and look, 68020. So it's definitely seeing the processor, although it does say no FPU. And I've actually gone ahead and installed the floating point unit off the radius card onto here and it's still not seeing it. There does seem to be a performance improvement when I run the benchmarks, but speedometer 4.0 doesn't work properly on system six. It only sort of works. So I need to get this machine booted up off of system seven so I can run a full benchmark suite and check out the performance. I did some Googling around trying to find drivers that might work for this card because people in that forum thread seem to indicate that ones that weren't necessarily designed for this card did work. And I found this Mac driver museum page here, which does seem to have working links to a bunch of different accelerator cards, including some for the SE. So at the bottom here, I've gone ahead and downloaded all the ones that seemed appropriate. And there was even Gemstart 3.0, which was mentioned in that forum posting. But unfortunately, this link is bad. Gemstart 2.1 does work. One thing to note here in this text, it says this driver fixes the distorted sound problem that otherwise accompanies the Novi boards. I was playing Crystal Quest with the speaker hooked up and the sound was definitely distorted. You probably wouldn't notice it if all you ever heard was like beeps and boops out of the internal speaker while doing productivity applications. But any kind of gaming, the distorted sound is very apparent. It's got a lot of clicks and pops inside of the sound. So the fact that this can only see four megabytes of RAM when clearly eight megs are installed had me thinking that maybe it's the original Macintosh SE ROMs that are the problem. They just don't look for anything more than four megabytes of RAM. Maybe there was special software for this accelerator, the Orion card, that allowed it to see all eight megs of memory once the system started to boot. 
So that got me thinking, what system of similar vintage to this Mac SE supports more than four megabytes of RAM? Well, checking out all the Macintosh ROMs here, the 256K ROM in the Mac SE here is similar in age to the Mac 2 ROM, which was also 256K. Perhaps if I replace the ROMs that are on this board with the Mac 2 ROMs, it'll not only see that additional memory, but maybe it'll see the math code processor as well, because of course, a Mac 2 had a 68020 and math code processor stock right from Apple. So how exactly do I go about replacing these ROM chips? These are mask ROMs and not EEPROMs. Well, let's take a look at the pinouts for them. Over here on the right, you see the pinout of the ROM chip on the Macintosh SE. And on the right is the pinout for the 27C010 EEPROM. It's 128K and two of them, of course, equals a 256K of the ROMs built into this machine. The pinout is luckily extremely close with really the only difference being the output enable pin 24 here is address line 16 on the Macintosh ROM. Address line 16 is up here on pin two on the EEPROM. So the reality is all of the pins line up except for this one. And you would just leave these four pins hanging off the top of the socket. I'd need to hook pin 32 to 30, 24 on the EEPROM to pin 22, which would hook up output enable to chip enable. Those need to be tied together. And 22 on the socket, that's address line 16, needs to be jumpered up to pin 16 up here on the EEPROM. Does that actually work for booting a Mac successfully? Well, I just tested right here on this motherboard and absolutely it does work. All of these jumpers are here to make sure that I've made all those connections on the spreadsheet. And I do just have the EEPROMs hanging off the bottom there with those four pins and it works absolutely perfectly. So this is just running the standard Mac SE ROMs. I'm just gonna make some Mac 2 ROMs like this and give them a try. I have the Mac 2 ROMs here and all the wiring I'm gonna have to install in here to uh, give it a test. Of course, if this does work, and I really think it's a long shot, it's not gonna work, but if it does, I can just uh, solder some wires onto the pins to avoid all of this ridiculous mess. All you really need is to take the address line off of one of these sockets. Actually, you'll probably find it somewhere else on the board to wire up to those extra pins. And yes, all the address lines are parallel between these two sockets. All right, I have the Mac 2 ROMs on these EEPROMs. And before I wire this up, what I wanna do is I'm gonna test the original ROMs that were on this board that didn't seem to work in a working motherboard. Let's just verify that these do work because absolutely it was the fix to switch to the ROMs from the other motherboard to get the accelerator working. Um, okay, we're getting an unhappy Mac. That indicates that I think one of the ROMs is not working quite right. Notice right here it says ROM high for the sticker that says high and low for the one that says low. Maybe these stickers are wrong. I should just peel them off fully. Acetone quickly and easily took the stickers right off. And I have the working chips just sitting right here. And that one is the high chip, uh, 352, 352. And then the low chip is 353 and 353. So it definitely matches, but clearly something was wrong. When I turned the computer on, it gave that sad Mac, which would indicate that parts of these ROMs are non-functional. I'm just giving them a quick inspection to make sure none of the pins are bent or anything like that. They are not. Let's just try one more time. And just as before, it immediately boots to the SAD Mac. I'm gonna use these good working chips to figure out which of these two chips is actually bad. And there we go. We appear to have a working Mac SE. It was the low ROM of the pair that was bad. So this chip is going into the dead parts bin. All right, there we have it. Mac 2 ROMs <laughs> installed onto an accelerator plugged into a Mac SE. I'm really not sure why I think this could even possibly work. The Macintosh 2 doesn't have built-in graphics or video of any kind. It uses Nubus video cards. And clearly the Mac SE, well, it has built-in video. There's just no way this is actually going to do anything. But it can't hurt to try. And I'm really not sure if anyone has ever tried this particular setup before on an accelerated Mac SE. This has got to be a 10 out of 10 for sketchiness. It really does. <laughs> Okay, I'm ready to try this out. I'm gonna say there's a 90% chance that this is not gonna work at all. And we're just gonna see the garbage on the screen as if there were no ROM installed at all. 
Here we go. <laughs> Prepare for garbage. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not surprising at all. Not even a little bit. <laughs> Let's just turn it off and on really quickly. Yeah, a little bit of uh, garbage there from the RAM. But yeah, it's not even initializing the video. Are we surprised even a little bit? Nope, not at all. Okay, so it's time to go back to the stock Mac SE ROMs, which will get this computer booting. And then it's time to start trying those drivers, which I found online, to see if any of those will initialize the extra RAM, maybe get the floating point unit working. If anything, this little bit of a mess here was good in that it confirmed that you can replace the ROMs with EEPROMs and you don't even need to build an adapter necessarily. You can just program the EEPROMs and then wire these changes up permanently using little jumper wires and solder them on and it will absolutely work. On this accelerator, uh, the space was a little tighter because the chips are very close to each other. So I had to put one of the two chips inside of a socket that was then plugged into um, what was on the board here. With the original ROMs back in the accelerator board, the machine does indeed boot, so my tinkering didn't screw it up. And there we go. I have condensed like 10 hours of tinkering into literally just a jump cut because I figured out quite a bit about the Mac SE with the Orion accelerator in it. You'll notice I have the $6.50 Mac Classic 2 set up on the bench here. But it's actually got the regular Classic 1 motherboard because for all intents and purposes, it's exactly the same performance as a bone stock Macintosh SE. I have the same exact system 7.01 system on both of these machines right here and they both have four megabytes of working memory. So it's a good direct comparison to see the performance improvement. And oh, is there an improvement? The Mac SE now feels so much faster and better to use with System 7 than the original Mac Classic did. And just using this machine with System 7 reminds me of how frustratingly slow System 7 is on these original Macintosh machines. It's a little bit like Apple releasing newer versions of iOS for their iPads and iPhones supporting really old devices. You have to applaud them, but there were several versions of iOS on really old devices that made the device almost unusable. Just moving this window around, you'll notice how slow it draws the background contents. And look, if I pull down the menus and things, see how slow that is? Contrast that to the Mac SE with the accelerator in it and notice that it draws the contents of the windows behind very quickly. And the menus themselves, while they're not incredibly fast, are still quite fast and responsive when you use them compared to this machine. Look at that. The menus are simply so sluggish compared to this. Remember, these are running identical systems with identical software loaded in every respect. Why don't we try Microsoft Word 5.0? Uh, <laughs> okay, this one just crashed. And the Mac Classic actually worked. Now, the funny thing is, is that crashing and instability is not a problem with the accelerator because I did testing on this machine with the accelerator removed, basically using a different motherboard, and the same exact crashing was happening with certain applications. So I have a feeling that System 7, at least this install of System 7, somehow doesn't like the ROM version that this Mac SE is running on. So it's crashing sometimes. So I can assure you that that crash had nothing to do with the accelerator. It has all to do with System 7 on this machine. Let's try Microsoft Word 4.0 here. This one doesn't seem to crash. Look at the difference. It's already up on that machine and it's still loading here. And this is actually running off of an SD card and that's running off a hard drive. So theoretically, this one should be a little faster. Let's try loading a demo document, legal stationary template. Boom, popped up immediately. And this one, very slow. Scrolling in the document, it's obvious that there is such a speed difference here. This is actually nice to use. This works. You know, you could do your word processing on this without an issue. It's definitely sluggish though. So performance on the SE with the accelerator is leaps and bounds better than it was stock, but all is not perfect. 
actually is working pretty much perfectly, except for the sound. Now I alluded earlier in the video to a problem with the sound and that it's very common for accelerators on these classic Macs to exhibit issues with the sound. Typically the drivers that you got with your card would patch something in the OS to make the sound work properly, but nothing I can do makes the sound work properly on the Mac SE anymore. I'm gonna use the game Tetris to demonstrate the sound on a machine where it works properly like the Mac Classic here versus the one where it's not working. First, let's load up Tetris very slowly on this, and I'll put the microphone up to the speaker. This is clearly how the in-game music is supposed to sound when it's working properly. Now let's try on the Mac SE. The sound issues on this Mac SE happen whether I'm in a System 6 or 7, and it doesn't seem to matter which accelerator driver I'm using, probably because none of them are the exact right one for this card. I did test removing the accelerator from this motherboard and testing to make sure the sound worked fine, and it does. This problem happens only when the accelerator is installed, and it's a very, very typical problem for this type of accelerator. Now getting the motherboard installed in this computer with the accelerator connected to it was a little bit difficult. One of the main reasons why it was hard to get in was this connector right here. This is that expansion connector on the accelerator designed for the video card that theoretically would have gone in the back of this machine. If this connector weren't there, it actually would be really easy to slide the entire motherboard in as it was designed. The motherboard mounting method in this is a little bit better than the earlier Macs because in the old ones, you had to slide the motherboard out the back of the machine. But on this one, you only have to slide it out just a little bit and then you can hinge it down. Problem is this connector here takes up almost the entire opening there. So you can't slide the motherboard back. The only way I was able to get it into the case was by bending this part of the metal here so that I could have the motherboard in position and then hook this around the motherboard. Luckily, this metal is relatively flexible and it didn't bend, it kind of went back into position. So that's the way you have to get this board in and out is by bending the case. So it's not ideal, but it could be worse. I suppose because this accelerator never actually had an expansion card that plugged into this, if I just remove this connector by desoldering it, then this would slide in and out really easily. You can just see under here the RAM slots for the memory on the accelerator, and I'm only using four megabytes in this card. That's because I couldn't get the other four working anyway, so there's no point to leave them in the machine. You use the four slots, the two on each side, closest to the front of the machine, and the other two slots stay empty. With low-profile SIMs installed, which is what I have, there is no problem with clearance in there, and I think probably regular height ones probably would have fit as well. Due to the angle of the SE's case, there's actually more space for the RAM up by the front here than there were if the slots were back here. So it's a pretty smart design, by Mac Peak here. Now, even though the sound doesn't totally work on this machine, I'm gonna leave the accelerator installed in here and put this thing back together. And that's really because as a youth, I really, really, really wished I had an accelerator. So the fact that there's one in here now is super cool to me. Even though at this point I have a Macintosh SE30 and I have a Classic 2 and I have other faster compact Mac machines anyways I can use, and those have working sound, I just think it's so extra special that this is the actual SE that I had as a kid and that now it is much faster than it ever was. Looking at the back of the machine, it shows the original specs from this machine when we bought it. One megabyte of RAM, 800K disk drive, and a 20 megabyte hard drive. The hard drive never got upgraded while we used this machine. I did have a larger external drive that I used in conjunction with the internal 20 megabyte drive, but the one megabyte of RAM was quickly upgraded to four megabytes as soon as RAM prices came down a little bit, just because it makes the computer so much more usable. This machine is sporting the original fan, which is relatively loud, and it has a spinning hard drive, which is also pretty noisy. I think this is like a 140 megabytes or 160 megabytes, something like that. The original 20 meg drive was a mini scribe and it did die after a long, long life. I think the original hard drive was still working when this machine was sort of put out of service and put away for storage, but it's when I went to go play with it again, years later, that I found that, that original hard drive was no longer functional. So let's talk about the drivers I'm using for the accelerator. You don't actually need any drivers to use the accelerator, at least this one. It just works out of the box. 
The problem is the stock Macintosh ROMs don't really know about the caches that are available with the 68020 processor, so it doesn't enable them. The default power-up configuration of the processor is more like a compatibility mode with those caches disabled, so the ROM or some kind of software needs to turn on those caches. And that's exactly the same on the Amiga or any other machine where you upgrade from a 68000 to something that has instruction and data caches. So earlier when I downloaded all the drivers that I could find for accelerators for this machine, I found that two of them actually worked on this machine, while all the others didn't work at all. It would actually freeze the computer when it booted up. The one that's on here right now is the Marathon Racer 030 driver from Dove Computer Corporation. And you can see here it has some check marks for the instruction cache, the data cache, and also the FPU package, which I think is what tells software that the machine has an FPU and you should use it if you can. It has a checkbox for external cache, which I'm pretty sure this thing does not have. There's no cache memory on this board, but it seems harmless to have that checked. It doesn't seem to really do anything. If I uncheck these and I reboot, it is effective and the caches are no longer working anymore, nor is the FPU seen. It's kind of like the computer when you don't have this driver loaded at all. Inside speedometer here, it is actually reporting the CPU as a 68030, which is obviously not true, but it doesn't seem to cause any harm. And it is showing the FPU though as the 68881, which is what it actually is. It does strangely show an MMU type as the Mac 2 AMU, which was the weird MMU that Apple included with the Macintosh 2. It was not the standard Motorola MMU. It was actually one that Apple designed that wasn't as functional as the Motorola one. So here are two different benchmark runs. On the left, we have the machine running with all the caches enabled, and on the right, the caches are disabled. And the scores you see here are relative or a multiplier of the Macintosh Classic speed, which would be basically what this machine is stock without the accelerator. So the CPU speed with the caches enabled is 3.48 times faster than the original processor that's in here. And without the caches, you get 2.35. The speed of the graphics on the internal display are also similarly improved dramatically. And that's because the CPU is doing the pixel pushing. There's no coprocessor. So the faster processor is able to do that so much faster. Turning off the caches does slow down the graphics. You can ignore the disk speed because that's highly dependent on what kind of drive there is compared to whatever they originally ran. And then the math speed is also a huge improvement, 6.89 times faster than the original Classic, which of course has no math coprocessor. I don't know if this math speed is using the coprocessor or is just using the math capabilities built into the processor. Anyways, the overall performance rating of the machine according to these benchmarks is 3.24 times faster than the original Mac Classic. So that's really why this thing is such a huge performance increase on this computer. These are just various benchmarks here, and you can see that they're all dramatically improved over the original machine. And there is quite a big difference between having the caches enabled and not enabled as well. Down here, we see some FPU tests, and you'll notice that there's almost no difference between the caches enabled and disabled. And that, of course, is because the math coprocessor itself doesn't have caches in it. Turning the CPU caches off doesn't have a dramatic effect. It does have a small decrease in performance, but it's not very sizable compared to all the other tests. So those benchmarks in speedometer definitely confirm my feelings just using this computer. The performance increase is massive with this accelerator. It's huge. And definitely having those caches enabled using this software makes a huge difference as well. You're leaving a lot of performance on the table if you're not turning on those caches. Now, besides the Racer 030 software, I found that there was one other piece of software that also worked. And it was this software right here, the Applied Engineering Warp 030 Control Panel. It has checkboxes to enable the math coprocessor, so that's the 882 in this case, but it seems to work either way, and the instruction and data caches. And it actually has extra checkboxes for burst mode as well, which I'm not sure that the 68020 even has. You can also enable it and disable those caches while the system is running or at the next boot up. If I push the info button, it actually thinks here that the processor is 68030 and an 882 for the math coprocessor, which is clearly wrong. And yeah, there is no MMU installed in this board, so that is correct at least. Running speedometer, it also says that the FPU is a 68882, so that's interesting that it's tricking this program as well. I'm gonna run a few of the benchmarks just to see if there's any performance difference between the applied engineering software and the uh, other stuff. I have a feeling it will be exactly the same. Okay, I stand corrected on the performance on the applied engineering driver versus the other one. It is actually faster 
The CPU and graphics speed are essentially identical. You could ignore the disk one, but the math speed is 6.89 with the other driver and it's 12.04 on this one. I wonder if it's like intercepting certain instructions and running them through the FPU or something. Kilowattstones is also 26.57 on this one and 21.66 on the other driver. That's really surprising. There's also an improvement on some of these, like the fast Fourier is 10.51 and on the other driver is 8.79. The performance of the FPU is identical for the most part. I mean, slightly slower on this test than that one, but I have a feeling that's a margin of error. So I guess there's no difference there. There's just something going on here that speeds up some of this. Maybe it was those burst things it talked about in the control panel. Since there's actually a performance difference, let's run Tetris and just see if the music or the sound is fixed with this driver. I'm not holding out hope that it is. All right, so obviously the sound is not working any better, which is too bad. It would have been sweet if it did, but oh well. So there we have it. It was quite an adventure, and there was a lot of trials and tribulations trying to get this old Orion accelerator working in my old Mac SE. But it was fun, and it was kind of cool that it does actually work, and the only thing missing would be the actual manual for it, so I knew how those jumpers and the RAM config worked, and of course, the correct software so that the sound would work properly. Now, I can hear people in the comment section now saying, what's the point of all this? You should just get a Mac SE 30 or a Mac Classic 2 even. That is absolutely correct. In fact, a Mac SE 30 motherboard would just drop directly into this machine and have an even bigger performance boost than uh, this particular accelerator does. But that's not the point really, right? That was an expensive upgrade. Apple's motherboards cost a ton of money if you wanted to do this upgrade back in the day. So these accelerator cards were a great option for people who had an existing machine like we did and wanted a performance improvement. Fortunately, it was something I could never get when I was a kid and I had moved on to the Amiga and PCs and other types of systems by the time I could have got one of these accelerators really cheaply. But I really remember being frustrated by the slow performance of this exact machine, especially with System 7. And clearly this accelerator card or any other at the time would have made all the difference to make this computer totally fast and so much more enjoyable to use. So I hope you found this video interesting. I know there's a lot to take in because I covered a lot of different stuff very quickly here. I will try to put the relevant links in the description below to things like those websites and stuff that I saw. And I'd love to hear from you if you are aware of where I can get the real drivers for this or perhaps some other drivers that at least claim to fix the sound problems with the accelerator. That would be, that would be the cherry on top to get this thing working really well. If you enjoyed it, a thumbs up would be appreciated. If you didn't, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button, comments down below. Don't forget to check out my second channel if you haven't already. And a huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. I really appreciate the support that they have given me. And if you want to become a patron yourself, you can do so at the link in the description below. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.